perhaps you could remind all of us what are circadian rhythms and why should we care about them if we're interested in living a long, healthy life? Well, circadian rhythms are daily timetables of uh, everything that goes on in our body. For example, every hormone, every digestive juice, every brain chemical, neurotransmitter, and even every gene in our genome is programmed to rise and fall at specific time of the day or night. And these timely activities of our genome and our hormones and everything helps us to stay resilient and prevents disease. And when we have strong circadian rhythm, even if we fall sick, then it accelerates cure and we can get back to full functionality much quicker. And this is not only one type of disease, uh, they affect almost all aspects of health, um, infectious disease, metabolic disease, brain affective disorders, or depression, anxiety, etc., and also injuries and recovery from injuries. And since the reason why we can't live longer and live a healthy life too long is because we fall sick to any one of these four diseases. That's why circadian rhythms are very important from starting from newborn until we are 100 years old. Do all living organisms have a circadian rhythm? Yes, almost uh, all living organisms, except some bacteria and viruses, uh, every, everyone has circadian rhythm. The reason is all life forms on our planet evolved under roughly 24 hours light dark cycle. Um, and that's why there is strong rhythm in light and darkness. There is rhythm in humidity. There is rhythm in temperature. And we have to all have to adapt. So that's why all organisms have circadian rhythms. And so as I understand it, these uh, rhythms, whether we're talking about um, heart rate or blood pressure fluctuations throughout the day, these are controlled by local mechanisms, but all, also central mechanisms or a master clock that we've spoken about before. Perhaps you could explain the significance of there being a, a kind of central master clock in the brain and then these peripheral clocks that all kind of work together. Yeah, so as uh, we just discussed, since uh, all life forms, including us humans, we evolved on this planet, and there is, a, there is one thing that is constant that has happened over the last 200,000 years. That is, every day the sun came up, and then <laughs> at the evening it went down. Whether there was cloudy or not, there was light throughout the day, and then there was darkness. So that's why the circadian rhythms take the strongest cue from our environment by tracking when it is light and darkness. And the best organ in our body that senses this light is the eye, are the eyes. So that's why the idea is if we can connect part of the brain straight to the eye then, and put the circadian clock there, then that would act as the master circadian clock because it can sense light from outside and then control visual. So that's why we have what is called suprachiasmatic nucleus, uh, which is a small brain part that's um, almost at the base of our brain, consisting of only 20,000 neurons that's smaller than the tip of a pinhead. And those neurons are directly connected to the eyes through a specific, special type of light receptors, blue light receptors. And these SCN neurons control sleep-wake cycle and our hunger satiety cycle. Uh, and they also secrete some neurotransmitters or brain chemicals that actually go and, and train or orchestrate rhythms in other parts of the body. Depending on the time of the day, as the light is changing, that, that area of the brain, the SCN for short, is detecting that change in the environment. And then that is sending some type of signal, be it through nerves or through chemicals, that change our physiology based on those changes in the environment. And the purpose of that is to kind of prepare us 
physiologically for what we should be doing in the environment at that time of the day? Well, the SCN actually ch- checks mostly the onset of light. So that means when it is the first ray of light um, that we receive and also the last one. Uh, throughout the day, it's not that sensitive to change the changes in the light intensity, but I would come back to you because there are other parts of the brain that actually sense light intensity and then they change mood, et cetera. Um, so SCN, again, the same set of blue light sensors that send information to the SCN, they have a second or third job. Uh, that is, they also send information to other parts of the brain that regulate alertness, sleepiness, etc. cetera. So um, it's... You're right. <laughs> the same light sensors are sensing changing changes in the light intensity throughout the day. Uh, but SCN's job is just to check timing. And you mentioned another thing that, yes, SCN actually does mostly three major things. Controlling sleep-wake cycle is a big thing. And then controlling body temperature. Our body temperature goes through one degree rhythm and hunger satiety, those are the three. And then SCN is part of the hypothalamus of base of the brain that also uh, connects to adrenal gland, uh, sorry, uh, pituitary and adrenal gland or pituitary and gonadal axis. So in that way, SCN controls a lot of hormones that are involved in metabolism and also hormones involved in reproduction. This episode is proudly brought to you by Inside Tracker. Track your blood biomarkers, understand your biological age, and receive personalized lifestyle tips backed by evidence to optimize your health. To get started with Inside Tracker today and get 20% off your first purchase, head to insidetracker.com forward slash Simon. That's insidetracker.com forward slash Simon for 20% off. What's the relationship between the SCN, this central clock, and the peripheral clocks, if any at all? Yeah, so uh, when we say peripheral clocks, uh, what we, almost 20, 25 years ago, um, scientists figured out that there is not only one master clock in the brain, actually clocks are present in every cell, in every organ, even on our skin, even in the hair follicle, (laughs) everything has clocks. And that became a little... uh, complicated because then the question is, what is the role of the SCN clock and what is the role of these local clocks? And then it became very clear that the SCN clock acts as the master clock, just like we have an atomic clock that tells uh, all over the world what time it is and then we adjust our local clocks. So similarly, the SCN clock is kind of the master clock, but all the local clocks in our liver, in our gut, um, heart, etc., they also sense what's going on locally and they are just physiology metabolism accordingly and the good example is for example as i told you light resets or entrance our scn clock but when it comes to liver although liver is getting some input from the scn if we eat at the wrong time when we're not supposed to eat then the liver clock has to respond and say huh Maybe tomorrow food will come at 10 o'clock in the morning instead of 8 a.m. breakfast. So I got to readjust my local clock. So that's the role of these local clocks. They kind of try to readjust based on what's going on with our food, exercise, or other factors, factors other than the light dark cycle. When you say everything has clocks, can you take us inside a cell here for a moment? at a basic sort of physiology, biology level, where do these circadian rhythms or these clocks within the cell, where do they lie? Like what, what, would, we, what would we see if we're looking at the part of the cell that's actually controlling this and, and is uh, essentially giving that cell information as to what it should be doing at a certain time of the day? Yeah, so this is uh, – so right now we, we are going into the core molecular biology or genes, proteins, that level. And then the concept I'm going to tell you, that's the, that's the work uh, of almost dozens of scientists over 30 years, starting from 1971 until 2000. 
Sure. Um, before 1970, people didn't think that there are clocks inside, inside our body that tell us what to do at what time of the day. So uh, scientists began with making mutations. So that means they would irradiate or they would make uh, some mutant fruit flies, mutant mice, etc. And then these mice or these fruit flies have the wrong sense of time. And then it took a lot of work to figure out uh, what is wrong with their clocks, and that led to the discovery of this mechanism. So we all know that there are DNA that is present in every cell, and this DNA holds the blueprint of everything inside the cell, how much of protein is uh, produced, how much of fat, how the mitochondrial energy production happens. Everything is encoded in this DNA. So similarly, there is a handful of genes maximum of 12 genes. So in our body, there are 20 to 30,000 genes. And out of these, only a dozen or so are involved in this timekeeping mechanism of clock. And uh, there are two genes, and the name is actually clock, and then another one is female. So these two proteins, uh, they are... They do a very special work, just like many thousand, nearly a thousand other proteins. What they do is they go and find which genes have to be turned on, and then they bind to that DNA and then turn that gene on. So clock and female go and find certain genes and turn them on. And some of those genes um, are also called period. There is another protein or gene, and cryptochrome. Just, just let us take them as period and cry. So this, uh, they turn these genes on, and then these genes, when they're turned on, they make proteins. Proteins are like enzymes. Um, it's not the protein that we eat. I, of course, the protein we eat is also similar to these proteins, but they do. They have different function. So this cry and period pour, um, as soon as they have made. They actually come back and <laughs> tell, no, 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 we don't want clock and people to work. We'll actually turn them off. And they come and turn them off. So this time between clock and bemol turning on cry and period protein, and then these proteins take some time to accumulate, and then they come back and turn off clock and bemol. So that entire cycle takes 24 hours. It's almost like, I don't know about a uh, specific country, but in the U.S., for example, in the freezer, we have an ice maker. <laughs> and you turn on the ice maker, the ice keeps building, building, and then once the ice level comes to a high level, it turns off the ice making mechanism. And then you take the ice out of the ice maker, and when you take the ice out, then the ice maker begins to build up again. So similarly, this cryptochrome and pore proteins, as their levels go up and up and up, they turn off, uh, they inhibit, in technical term, what clock and people do. But fortunately, there are other proteins that come and chew off this clock and people, sorry, the pore and cry, which is almost like you taking out the ice cubes from the ice maker, <laughs> and then clock and people come back and make. So this cycle takes roughly 24 hours. And since these proteins, they do have, this is, this, is, this is not their only job because clock people can also turn on thousands of other proteins. And so this cycle is connected to uh, regulation of thousands of other genes, other protein. So as a result, there is a wave of genes turning on, and then there is another wave of genes turning off. So all of these work together to um, make this 24 hours clock.